Good morning, Northridge. If you're able, would you stand and sing with us? I stand amazed in the prayer. Good morning. We're so thankful you, you decided to worship with us this morning. I um, have a lot of announcements today, so buckle your seatbelts and don't fall asleep here because we have a lot, lot going on at the church. It's really exciting. Um, the first thing I want to announce is our uh, 24 prayer, out, prayer vigil is um, this week. So um, if we, I think, Bruce, did you put a clipboard over here we can pass around for that? Oh, it's already going around. So um, you can find out more about that. There's a table out in the foyer um, if you want to know more about that. Um, sign up for your Immerse books, um, Beginnings. That's going to be starting here in a, a two or three weeks. We're going to be starting with um, that new series. So you can sign up for that in the foyer. Um, there's a lot of people already signed up, so make sure you do that. Um, you can go ahead and buy a copy of the book, too. Um, so make sure you're in on that. Um, let's see. The Evening Friends Women group will have their annual soup luncheon um, on Sunday, January 26th. So um, that's next week, and I'm just realizing when I made that announcement, it's probably my one-year anniversary of messing up that announcement from last year. There's people that still um, say, Parker, you messed up that announcement. Um, I said that only women were allowed. 
but I was wrong. It's men and women are allowed at this luncheon. So just, just, just to make sure we all are clear on that. And um, yes, so that's next week. So please make plans to stay for that. Also, uh, let's see, next week is also um, celebrating a shower for Mark and Allie Persinger. Um, that's going to be after the soup luncheon. Um, Mark uh, helped a lot in the youth room and uh, with youth programs. He, he uh, helped as a volunteer for the quiz program, and they also helped lead worship at camp um, this past uh, summer. Um, if you are having trouble remembering who Mark is, he has very long hair. Sometimes he would play the piano, kind of the hippie-looking guy. Um, I can say that because he's one of my best friends, and I was the best man in his wedding. So uh, maybe that helps lock your memory, but um, please come help and uh, celebrate them. Uh, let's see. Uh, youth groups starting back up tonight, Sunday night youth groups. So um, I think tonight we're going to do crazy t-shirt night. So if you have a crazy t-shirt, please wear that, um, and we'll have fun with that. Um, let's see. You all got a handout with the uh, uh, Women's Ministry If Gathering. Um, you can read more about that. I don't know much about it, but um, I'll just read kind of some of it here. We will be hosting a live stream viewing of the If Gathering event on February 7th and 8th at NFC. Um, register to attend via the link in your weekly email. Thanks to a generous donor, lunch will be provided. Um, if you have any questions, you can talk to Joyce uh, Veenstra, Linda Steinacher, or my wife. Uh, Krista, and then uh, also you're invited uh, to this 40 Days uh, with Jesus Coffee and Conversation Among Friends, a Lenten-focused devotion and discussion on the impact Jesus has on each of our lives, and that's every Thursday, so that's different from the If Gathering. This is every Thursday from 10 to about 12 um, through, through February 6th through April uh, 2nd, so you can also sign up. Um, by emailing the church office to that. So uh, you can look at more there. Everybody got that handout. Um, and then also um, just wanted to announce there has kind of been a tragedy um, in the Friends Church. If anybody knows the, the Schaefer family, um, they passed her in Oklahoma City, and um, their daughter um, was in a car accident and passed away this past week. So uh, make sure you keep their family in your prayers, and um, we're going to be taking a van tomorrow. Is that right? down to the funeral. So um, if you're interested in that, you can talk to Manny or Joy about that, about going to the funeral. And then, yeah, I think now we have an announcement from Kevin. Well, I, and again, I just want to thank you for um, announcing uh, about the funeral. And, and as you all know, the, the power of prayer is so huge. And so just hold them up um, and make that a point of, uh, even if you don't know them, wow, faithful servants in, in, in the Friends Church. We just want to allow the comfort of Christ to be with them. So this last um, business meeting, I had the opportunity to share some great news, some celebration that, I, I frankly, we all need to hear. Some of you thought in, uh, in October it was just a little too long because we were doing way too much conversation about this beyond Northridge and how we're uh, doing work over season. Some of you thought, man, that's just not nearly enough. We need to be talking about that all the time. Well, I'm here to tell you, regardless of where you stood on that one, it is so exciting to see Northridge step forward and accept their challenge to impact their neighborhood and their, as well as their community and the world. And you heard that, uh, that challenge, and not only did you choose to continue to uh, do what we have been doing, uh, especially overseas, um, but this last, you not only met kind of what we were doing last year, but increased what you chose to, um, to participate by 15%. And that sounds fine, and if I told you it was 15%, you'd say, wow, that's good. If I told you it was $7,000, yeah, that's good. But here's what I wanted you to know. The impact of that is Incredible. Because of that, there's going to be a group of folks from our church that will have the opportunity to be trained in discipling for development, not for Africa, not for Thailand, but for the community right here, and just find, figure out how we can make disciples uh, uh, and, and creating whole life gospel in work right here in our own city. That is because of your generosity. Secondly, in the most closed country in the world, in Bhutan, we have the ability to have ongoing connection with a, a group of missionaries there that uh, will remain unnamed uh, because we're streaming this. But because of that, you are having an impact. Northridge is having an impact in Bhutan, 
one of the close, most closed com, uh, countries of the world. And lastly, we were able for the first time to generously embrace um, Albert and Mitali uh, Adhikari in their work in Bangladesh. I'm telling you, having them in my home for um, a week this last week was amazing as I see his passion to create godly leaders that will long outlive him and his ministry. I'm telling you, the kingdom is moving forward, and Northridge is an absolute part of that. Thank you for your willingness to step up and be a part of that. And I tell you, as you think about it, this little, this little church in this little community in this little country is having such an amazing impact upon the kingdom of God. And I sim am simply proud to stand here on behalf and in representing this congregation to say, thank you, Lord, allow us to continue to make that happen. So with that enthusiasm, I want you to stand up and enthusiastically congratulate the person next to you for participating in changing the world. Amen.
There's no darkness in your eyes There's no question in your mind God Almighty God of mercy See, there's no hiding from your face There's no hiding from your face there's no striving in your grace God of mercy God almighty sing this this morning let there be light let there be
Let the light that shines above Come the light that shines in us There is no darkness in your way So have your way Jesus have your way Come to the river, all who are thirsty. Come and drink. Come to the table, all who are hungry. Come and feast. Those who are weary. Those who are weary.
us this morning. He's calling us into community. He's calling us deeper. So as we sing these words, don't just sing the meaning. Let's pray. God, we're grateful to be together in your presence this morning, Lord. We gather in agreement that you are Lord. We worship you. We give you thanks. Lord, as we continue our worship, we ask that you, Jesus, our present teacher, would speak to us. Lord, that you would teach us to be more like you. That you would help us as the body of Christ embody those characteristics that are attractive to the world around us, that break through lies, that bring healing and hope, that offer peace and justice. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. 
Amen. So if you're joining us for the first time, we're in the middle of a series called The More Better Life, which is bad grammar, but good theology. Uh, we talked about how the inspiration for this message series um, comes out of John's gospel, John 10.10. 10. Um, a, a lot of the translations we read talk about the abundant life, and I'm sure that's a phrase, if you've, if you've been in the church uh, at all, you've probably heard the phrase abundant life. But in Eugene Peterson's uh, message paraphrase, he talks about uh, a more and better life. And I really feel like that captures the idea, because abundance is not really a word that we use very often. We do, we think of abundant as like a lot. So we have an abundance of wealth, an abundance of time, but more and better, it, it, it gives it a little more depth. Um, more does, does speak to abundance, but better. Because sometimes we can have an abundance of something, but it's not necessarily good. Um, you know, an abundance of pain in my head for a migraine. You know, an abundance of debt, an abundance of illness. And so more and better, I think, captures the idea, um, the kind of life that Christ invites us into, the kind of life that he brings with him, the kind of life that we are called to. And so the first week we talked about the more better life is a generous life. A life of generosity invites partnership with Christ, invites us to co-labor with him. Christ comes into a community, a place, a people on the generosity of ordinary people. And so it's through your generosity as the church that we are enabled to be his hands and feet in the neighborhood, city, and world. Kevin just talked about it. Your generosity enables us to not only bring uh, an element of discipleship to our congregation, to our community, but it also invites us to partner with the things that God is doing all over the world. And so we ask that you would continue to be generous so that we can partner together to be his hands and feet, to make him known in our neighborhood, city, and world. And we talked about how the more better life is a life of community, how we're called to be together. The body of Christ calls us to, to come together, to partner together, to walk shoulder to shoulder with one another, to, to combine our gifts, our abilities, our talents, our passions with those of other people around us, and together as the church, we are more complete. We are a more complete picture of the body of Christ. We talked about how that life of community requires us to be present, to show up, to be, to be committed to our extension, our, our expression of the body of Christ. And so it's kind of hard for us to be uh, deeply involved in a community when we're not here. And so to make, to make being together a priority as, as we're invited to do in Hebrews, where it says, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but instead come together and encourage each other on towards love and good deeds. So that's the challenge. The more better life is a generous life. It's a life of community. And today we're going to talk about another element of the more better life. As I was preparing for this message, I read a story about a pastor who decided that his congregation was a little bit cold. They weren't, they, they weren't necessarily the friendliest bunch of people around. And so he got this inspiration one day that in order to help them kind of grow in their friendliness, that they were going to add a part to the service that we already do. They were going to start uh, a time of shaking hands and greeting each other. And so he, he got ready, he prayed, he, he preached a sermon on friendliness, and then he announced it at the end of the day, at the end of the Sunday morning. He says, hey, starting next week, we're just going to add a piece to our service. We're going to shake hands and greet each other and just be friendly to one another starting next week. And so after the service ends, People are, are ready to go, and one man turns around to the woman behind him, and he says, well, hello, good morning. And he reaches out his hand, and she says, excuse me, the friendliness does not start until next week. I hope that that's a made-up story. It wouldn't surprise me if it wasn't. But I was reading in a, on a church growth blog that I subscribed to about another man who took on uh, this study of churches and their hospitality. So he visits 18 different churches on 18 consecutive Sundays, trying to find out what churches are really like. And so he writes this. He said, I sat near the front. After the service, I walked slowly to the rear. Then I returned to the front and then back to the foyer using a different aisle every time. I smiled. I dressed neatly. I always ask, ask someone to direct me to a specific place, either the fellowship hall, the pastor's office, etc. If there was a coffee time, I remained and participated. And then he used a scale 
to rate the welcoming nature of these churches. He gave 10 points if a worshiper simply smiled at him. He gave 10 for a greeting from someone nearby. He gave 100 points if someone exchanged names with him. He gave 200 if someone invited him to have coffee. 200 for an invitation to return to the church. 1,000 points for an introduction to someone else in the church. And on this scale, 11 of the 18 churches earned fewer than 100 points. Five received less than 20 points. The main idea here is that in our churches, our teaching can be biblical, our singing can be inspirational, our sermons can be uplifting. But if a visitor comes in and concludes that no one cares about them, that no one cares if they're here or not, that no one has a desire to know them, then they are not likely to return. Biblical hospitality in the manner of Christ is not something that naturally emerges in our congregations. It takes intentionality. It takes hard work. But the lack of hospitality will have us settling for something less than the life that God desires for us. We read about the abundant life. John 10.10 is probably a favorite passage of most people because it offers us hope. But we are invited to partner with Christ in, in bringing forth that kind of hope. And the more better life is a life of hospitality. Thomas Reynolds explains that the kind of hospitality that the church is called to represent as the body of Christ is one that involves these things. Vulnerability. A mixing between guest and host that undoes the distinction between outsider and insider. Once a stranger is invited in, the host yields stability and control. Adjusting the household to accommodate and attend to the guest needs as they become apparent. Offering hospitality in this way invites disruption in household order and routine. In other words, it's the kind of hospitality that enables us as the hosts to surrender. To surrender our preferences. To surrender the things that we want. To surrender sometimes even our needs for the sake of the guest. It's the process of helping the visitor, the guest, the outsider become part of the community. The sad truth is, as you can tell by the study, that the examples of this kind of hospitality are very rare in the church. We tend to hold tradition and order in higher esteem than we do accommodating the needs of guests who are unfamiliar with the way things are done. Hospitality is fundamental, however, to the Christian life and to the gospel message that, Christ, that the church is invited to announce and proclaim. It's an essential element of the more better life that Christ invites us into. And, if, and we don't have to look very far into, into the scriptures to see the kind of hospitality that Christ invites us to co-labor with him in. It's, it's rampant in the gospels. The first miracle that Jesus performs at the wedding in Cana recorded in John chapter 2 was the changing of water to wine. And this act positioned him as both a provider and a host. Numerous accounts of healing, of feeding, of teaching, of caring for others. In Mark 6, Jesus provides food for a gathering of 5,000 people and in doing so, assumes the role of host to the multitude. In John chapter 13, as Jesus prepares to serve what we come to, we've come to know as the Last Supper, he assumes the role of host by removing his outer garment and bowing before his disciples in this interaction, Jesus changes the role of host forever. Because in assuming the role of host, he also assumes the role of servant. What would it look like for us to show up in church on a Sunday morning committed to being a servant to those around us? What would it look like for us to show up not wondering what's in it for me, but what can I bring to the table? What can I offer to those around me? What do you think about our church? Is it possible for a guest, a true outsider, not familiar with the way things are done, to come into our church and leave feeling unwelcome and unwanted? Is that hard to imagine or is that realistic? If so, then we are short of the call that Christ has given us as his body. We're missing out on the more better life. Generally, we feel good when we enter a home and are greeted with a floor mat that says, welcome. Or when we walk in and see a scripture verse on the wall, God bless all who enter this home. 
but we might get defensive or even anxious when we see a sign that says something like, beware of dog, or no trespassing. I had a friend in high school, and I liked to go to their house, but when I first started going, I noticed they had a really tall fence. Maybe it's because I'm short that it seemed really tall, but it seemed unusually tall. And on the fence, like in three places, it said, guard dog on duty. Now, I came to know that dog really well. It was a sweet dog, and I enjoyed spending time with that family but I always felt a little anxious approaching that house. It didn't give the ambiance of welcome. We get similar feelings when we're surrounded by people that are different than we are. Different languages, different customs, foods, different forms of dress, different things that we bring to the table. If you've ever been to another country, you can feel out of place. People stare, they point, they avoid us. Maybe they laugh or they whisper, but this doesn't just happen in culture. Unfortunately, it happens in our churches. Maybe we avoid contact with newcomers or people that we don't recognize. Maybe we stare at people that are different than us. Maybe we avoid people with a disability. Differences breed division in culture, and when that culture impacts the church, we can move from welcoming to unfriendly pretty quickly. Without realizing it, we can start to project unspoken symbols and signals that say, keep out, beware of dog. There's also subtle ways within the church community that we freeze out people that think and feel differently from the accepted norm. On the other hand, think of a time when you truly entered into an honest and safe and welcoming space. Think about going to a friend's house, being greeted at the door, never doubting whether or not you were wanted there. And when it's time to leave, they say, you have to go so soon. I really enjoyed our time together. We all crave that feeling of being wanted and seen and known. We want to be part of the company of other people. And God has known this since the beginning of creation. He's made known that he sees us that he wants us, and that he set in this ethos, this expectation of welcome in his kingdom. His kingdom is a welcoming kingdom. For example, the Old Testament gives many examples of God's position on hospitality. Outsiders, aliens, strangers are those people who are not part of Israel, but who interact with them and come in contact with them. And God writes several, or God speaks several things about these people. In Exodus, he says, do not oppress an alien. For you yourselves know how it feels to be aliens, because you were aliens in Egypt. In Leviticus, he says, do not, go, do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. In Numbers, he says, I am the Lord and I consider all people the same, whether they are Israelites or foreigners living among you. And Abraham gives us a really great example of the meaning of hospitality. In the story of Abraham and the three visitors, we have a picture of genuine hospitality in the ancient world. Abraham is a respected father, and he sits at the opening of his tent for a couple of reasons. One, because it's shade, but two, so that he can see out just in case a visitor would come their way, because it was his duty as the head of the household to welcome in any guests that would come their way. And so he sees these three strangers, and he runs to them while they're still far off. And then he runs back to Sarah and he says, hey, listen, we're going to have company. Bake some bread. Let's welcome them. And then he runs back out again and, and gets an animal for the feast and he serves them. By going out to meet them, Abraham shows humility and a willingness to accommodate the needs of his guests. He offers them water to wash their feet and in doing so meets an immediate need. Abraham offers these guests genuine hospitality without the expectation of being paid back. When they're done eating, when they're done washing, when they're done resting, he doesn't present them with a bill. He doesn't say, here's what you owe me. He doesn't respect any reciprocity at all. And yet, he is still blessed. He's blessed by hosting these guests. In the simplest terms, ancient biblical hospitality is the act of giving friendship to a visitor. The act of giving friendship to a visitor. Hospitality was the process of receiving in outsiders 
and changing them from strangers to members of the community. Quite different from our modern day understanding of hospitality. Today we think of hospitality and we think of entertaining friends, entertaining family. Christian teachers in the early church were very dependent on the hospitality of strangers. They would go from place to place and they would depend on somebody putting them up for the night, helping them with a meal, providing for their needs. Church historians maintain that Christianity would probably not have survived without the distinctive characteristic of hospitality and compassion in the early church. In other words, offering God's full welcome to strangers and outsiders was absolutely necessary for the spread of the church. And I would argue that it continues to be true today. In Jesus' name, these early believers would reach out to the needs of travelers, of outsiders, of marginalized people, and they would minister to them and love them and help them become members of the community, turning them from strangers to friends. This call to love is most clearly expressed in a parable that all of us are familiar with, the parable of the Good Samaritan. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus is approached by a lawyer who asks, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replies, what is written in the law? And the lawyer answers Jesus by reciting what we know today as the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. The lawyer isn't satisfied with this simple answer, and so he asks Jesus, but who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? And Jesus answers his question by telling a story about a man who was robbed and beaten and left for dead on a dangerous stretch of road. And the point of Jesus' teaching begins to emerge as he gets toward the conclusion, because it wasn't the priest or the Levite that become the heroes of the story, it was the Samaritan, which would have been absurd to the lawyer and to, and to those listening, because this Samaritan would have been seen as less than human, a half-breed. But through this story, Jesus taught that it doesn't matter whom we define as neighbor. We must simply be neighbor to all people. We hear the story of the Good Samaritan, and is isn't really shocking to us because we've heard it a lot. We understand that we're, we're called to love God and love people. It's probably a message that we hear quite often in the church. But this teaching would have been pretty groundbreaking to the lawyer and to the rest of the people listening that day because up until that moment... Up until that exchange between Jesus and the lawyer, the term neighbor was well understood to mean a fellow Israelite. And so when they heard that word neighbor, they automatically understood that that's someone like me. But Jesus eliminates that distinction. He redraws the cultural boundaries of holiness when he makes the Samaritan, the half-breed, the less-than-human, the hero of the story. No longer are people to be excluded based on categories, based on religious confessions, political creeds, social backgrounds, the color of their skin. Any other division and distinction that would have caused separation, Jesus eliminates. And now neighbor simply means all people. Anyone but me is my neighbor. And by contrasting the Samaritan with the priest and the, and the Levite, Jesus draws attention to the fact which the lawyer would have doubtlessly preferred to forget, that sometimes the outsider, sometimes the heretic, sometimes the heathen actually shows mercy and loving kindness, while those of us that claim to be the promoters of true religion prove to be hard-hearted and loveless. And finally in this exchange, Jesus eliminates the endless list of excuses that we often could come up with when we're faced with an opportunity to extend godly hospitality to other people. This priest and this Levite are a frightening reminder that it's possible to be so preoccupied, so concerned with our theological and religious and ecclesiastical activities that we have no time or energy left to love our neighbor. And when we decide that, whether by word or by action, we've also stated that we have no time left to love Christ himself. Now that might sound extreme until we hold it up against the backdrop of Jesus' own words in Matthew 25. 
Jesus begins to foreshadow a time when he will give an inheritance to those who offered him hospitality. And those who get the inheritance will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? And Jesus will reply, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Our commitment to welcoming other people, to loving our neighbor, or our decision to leave them out in the cold and ignore them, overlook them, carry a heavier significance when we begin to realize that Jesus himself experiences the result of our ministry or the lack thereof. Whatever we have done to the least of these, we have done to him. So when we care for the least of these, we've cared for Christ. When we've ignored the least of these, we've ignored Christ. The truth is that the entire biblical narrative, from Genesis to Revelation, reveals to us God's heart of hospitality. He desires the outsider, the outcast, the alien, the sojourner, the guest, to feel at home, to feel safe, to feel wanted. And as the church, we are his body. And as such, we're charged with the outworking of that reality. We are charged to be the hands and feet that welcome those people. I believe that all expressions of the church begin with the deep desire to be welcoming and inviting and to practice hospitality in ways that honor God, in ways that reflect the love of Christ. I would even contend that many of the churches that have lost their way in this area would still consider themselves to be a welcoming church. The path gets muddied it gets, it gets really messed up for us when, people, when the people of God begin to put more energy towards protecting themselves and their ideas of what it means to be the church and less energy toward embodying the nature of God revealed in the life of Christ. We lose sight of our purpose and we begin to think that we have to protect what we have. We have to guard it. It doesn't need guarding. It's the church. It's the body of Christ. It needs to be set free in the world. Tom Rainer talks about this shift in, in one of his books. He says that we move from the Great Commission to the Great Comfort. We, we, enjoy, we start to enjoy what we've produced. And pretty soon, we don't show up with the mindset of a servant. We show up with the mindset of a customer. What am I going to get out of it today? And when we come like that, we don't have eyes to see those in need. We don't have eyes to see those that come broken and needy. We don't have hearts for those that aren't like us. We don't have hearts for the guests. We don't have the intentionality to bring the stranger into friendship. As followers, as, as followers of Christ, we carry at the very heart of our being the responsibility and the privilege of hospitality, of extending God's full welcome to those who are not yet part of the church, of the kingdom. Hospitality is part of who we are as the people of God. It's, it's actually in our blood. We are created in his image, and he is a welcoming God. It's a trademark of those who would be called disciples of Jesus Christ, of those who would be inhabitants of God's kingdom. And when we, get, when we can take this call to heart, when we can begin to show up with the mindset and the heart of a servant, of a host. How can I welcome? How can I love? How can I help someone be seen and known and heard? Then the gap that exists between the church and people not yet part of it begins to get filled up with the love of Christ. And we start to see the kingdom expand. And we start to experience the more better life. And the prayer that we pray the way that Jesus taught us to pray, that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, begins to become a reality. It truly is the doorway to the more better life. Let's pray. God, would you forgive us for the times that we fall short? Would you forgive us when we don't take up our role as host 
Would you forgive us, Lord, when we don't take up our role as servant? Lord, I confess there are times where I feel entitled, where I feel protective. Lord, would you help me to be free of that? Would you help me to trust that you are Lord, that you're God, that you sit on the throne, that I don't have to worry about things like that? That I'm free to love others as you've called me to? Lord, would you help us to be a welcoming community? Would you help us not be afraid of losing out on things that we want, on ideas that we have? Would you give us the grace to be sacrificial, to give up some of the things that we've come accustomed to in order to to be more accommodating? Lord, not compromising truth, not compromising distinctives, But Lord, in the non-eternal matters, would you help us to hold them loosely? Lord, this is your church, not ours. Would you help us to live and operate as such? We pray that you are lifted high, that you are glorified, that you are made known in our neighborhood, city, and world. Not Northridge. It's not the name of Northridge we want the neighborhood, city, and world to know. It's your name, Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Spend the next few moments in a time of open worship. Invite you to just reflect on and consider the words of Christ. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean in your life, in your sphere of influence? What would it look like for you to begin to show up at church, at your workplace, in your neighborhood with the mindset of a servant? How can you extend God's full welcome to those that you have opportunity to come in contact with? So allow the Holy Spirit to speak, to continue to teach us. As always, if you have a a word from from the Lord that's helpful and useful to the rest of the congregation, Please feel free to stand and share that. And if not, let's just sit in silence and wait on the Lord.
Are all hearts clear? To close this morning, we're going to sing a song called Your Love is Extravagant. And as I was sitting there listening to Manny's message, um, our prayer time this morning came to mind. And my little brother Ethan uh, said something that was very impactful to me. Um, he said, Lord, just make the words that are spoken this morning a song that is irresistible. And as I thought through this song that we're going to sing, we sing, I find that I'm moving to the rhythm of your grace. And as I sat there and the Spirit was speaking to me, I'm hearing this beautiful picture. Um, this song that's irresistible is love, and that's what we're being called into this morning. That hospitality is love, and that we as Christians should have a fragrance that's intoxicating. We're going to sing that. We should find ourselves moving to the rhythms of God's grace, and those rhythms are love. And if that's something that you identify with this morning, if you feel that, I'm excited for you. I think a lot of us have known Jesus for a long time, and I think it's really easy to forget what that song sounds like. So as we sing the song, I invite you to close your eyes. If you remember what that song sounds like, sit in that. Enjoy that, experience that this morning. If you've forgotten what that song sounds like, if you don't know what that song sounds like, come talk to Manny, come talk to me. We would love to talk to you about that, pray with you. But as we sing the song, Your Love is Extravagant, I invite you to feel those rhythms of grace, that song of love, that truth of the Christian life, that hospitality that we're talking about. Move to the rhythm of God's grace. Your love is extravagant.
consider me a friend and capture my heart.